it's past time to get started. So let's go ahead and get us started here. I, uh, I guess I'll start by welcome back and uh, take a look around the room. Oh, and I do see crutches in the back of the room. I, are those a spring break relationship? <laughs> okay, I guess so. Okay, I knew it was bound to happen. Okay. So, uh, anyways, uh, welcome back. I did throw the tests out here. It looks like you guys already saw them, and hopefully you already checked your score uh, online. If you forgot, uh, uh, you know, that link that I sent after the first test, it's, it's still there. It's still active. Uh, keep an eye on it, especially now that we're halfway done this, through the semester. Um, I'll, I'll finally get uh, a little more caught up and get all your labs and homework stuff graded, and then, of course, your... Your two tests that you've taken so far are, are, are posted there. Let's take a moment and, and, and look at it, um, <clears throat> at least symbolically. I won't be able to actually uh, punch in the numbers because all of your numbers on each of the tests are a little different from, from one another. But uh, we can at least talk about it symbolically and uh, then let you punch in the numbers. And I, uh, I think that will help um, most of your questions. If there was anything you missed, if there was, uh, you know, there's more specific questions on your individual numbers. Uh, please come see me after class, office hours in the lab, or talk to Don, uh, whatever it is here. But, but let's look at this, and then we will put closure to it and go on to our optics. That was the uh, nice thing about having the test right before the spring break. I know you had a lot going on before the spring break. Um, probably during spring break, you were glad you finally got that all done. And, 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 and in this, in this ca class, uh, we're shifting gears. So a whole new topic here in, in, in terms of, of optics. And so we've got a few of our optics stuff set up here. And we'll show you the optics in just a minute. But I'll start here with number one. Uh, number one was a, uh, you know, a thermal expansion. Hopefully you noticed it uh, right away from uh, the beginning. It is a thermometer. And it's a mercury thermometer. And you're going to put it in something warm. I drew a picture for you to try to uh, say, just worry about the bulb warming up, the, uh, the, the, the rest of it, you know, we don't need to worry too much about. But here's our bulb. Um, and probably worth drawing the inside of the bulb as well as the thickness of the glass like this. Uh, so you remember that when you put it in, what's going to happen is, of course, it is going to expand. That is, both the mercury will expand and the glass will expand here. And so as you write down the change in volume, you could say, all right, the change in volume is going to equal to beta times the initial volume times the change in temperature. And so there would be a change in volume of the mercury and there would also be a change in volume of the, and I think this was Pyrex. Yeah, of the, of the Pyrex, all right? And so both of those would have a beta. They would be different for mercury compared to the beta for the Pyrex. Um, the initial volume, though, is going to be the same. We're talking about this volume here where the mercury sits. And so the mercury is going to actually get bigger. Um, and for better or worse, the hole gets bigger too. And of course, that was one of the big things I tried to emphasize in that thermal expansion is that the holes get bigger. And you calculate the size of the hole as if it was filled with that material. So if you think of this hole being filled with glass, it will get bigger. And so the container gets bigger, uh, but the mercury gets bigger more than the hole gets bigger. So there's going to be an overflow, if you will, and that's going to send the mercury up the column here. So when you subtract the two, the beta from the mercury and the beta from the pyrex, you multiply it by the initial volume and then the change in temperature, you will get the overflow, the amount of overflow. And this is the part I can't put in the numbers because all the numbers are a little bit different in one way or, or another. All right, But you can put in your numbers for your test in there and, and see what that comes out to be here. But that's the extra mercury and it's that extra mercury that's going to go up the, up the column there. And if there was already some up the column, well, that's just going to push it higher. 
And so if the mercury had started, say, at this height, then all of that mercury is going to go up that little capillary tube. And so that increased volume must be equal to pi r squared times the height that it goes up. And so that was the idea of the, of the uh, overflow here. So a little bit of thermal expansion, both in terms of the mercury and the hole that makes it. Um, I gave you that, I gave you that, I gave you that, I gave you that. I think I did. Yeah. Um, I gave you that, I gave you that, and so eventually you can solve here for, for H. And so again, depending on what numbers you have on your test, the numbers will be different for different uh, tests, but that would be the, at least the idea behind uh, number one. And as I said, that's as much as I can do for, for number one is solve it symbolically, and then I'll let you put in the, put in the numbers there. Okay, and again, if your numbers don't make sense, uh, come see me. Uh, let's look at number two. Uh, number two had a little subtlety. It was, again, the ideal gas law right away here at the beginning in A. Hopefully you saw that, but remember PV equals 2 NRT. So obviously that's the relationship between pressure, volume, and temperature for any gas, and that's what we have here. It says there are two balloons. And depending on what test you have, the balloons are different size. Some of them are three liters, some of them are four liters, some of them are five liters, some of them are six liters. But there are two balloons. And one of the balloons is filled with helium, and the other one is filled with nitrogen. Not really important for step A, whether it be the helium or the nitrogen. That's why I say in, in A, do, do it for either balloon. There's no difference between the diatomic and the monoatomic at this point until we get to B. But in A, it says, okay, what's going to be this new volume? And so if you start here and say initial pressure times initial volume divided by initial number of molecules divided by the initial number of temperatures would equal R, then if you do something to that balloon or that gas, then we're going to have a final pressure and a final volume and a final number of molecules and a, a final temperature. And in this case, what we're going to do is we are going to put the balloon in a big ice chest. So the number of molecules is the same on both sides and that cancels off. And for that matter, it says go ahead and assume that the pressure doesn't change much, which is I guess roughly true depending on how much you actually change it, but <clears throat> just so I can make it an easier problem, I said that, but the pressure is determined by, you know, the, the elastic of that, of that balloon. And some of you have, I don't remember all the different pressures, but, uh, the, you know, everybody's got a little different pressure depending on how full this balloon is. And just assuming that it doesn't change its size too much, we could say the pressure doesn't change. At least that's the uh, idea of the, of the uh, problem here. And so we're going to find a new volume. So if you take your final temperature, divide it by your initial temperature, multiply by your initial volume, you will get the final volume. So that's the point there of A, is to find the new volume of the balloon. Notice again, it does not depend on whether it be monatomic or diatomic. It's the ideal gas law. We didn't even talk about monoatomic or diatomic or in the degrees of freedom until we got into specific heats. So, or I should say molar uh, specific heats. Um, so it, it really wasn't uh, necessary. The only thing that might throw you off a little bit here is final temperature. Hopefully you didn't miss that. What's the final temperature? Yeah, zero degrees Celsius, and hopefully in the equation you put 273 Kelvin uh, because it is a giant ice chest, and it's got ice and water, and so that was the clue there of what, what the final temperature was, was going to be. <coughs> as we jump into B here, it, it says, okay, now this is going to cool down. Obviously, as it cools down, um, it releases the energy, gives it to the ice, and the whole point of having ice in an ice chest is the ice will then melt, and the temperature will still remain at zero degrees Celsius. And so how much of this ice is going to melt is based upon how much energy is going to come out of it. And so like we did in the homework problems and like we did in the lab, uh, we can add up all the cues. Some energy comes out, some energy goes in. Stuff that goes out is negative numbers, stuff that goes in is positive numbers. But because of conservation of energy, because of the first law of thermodynamics, we know if we add them all together, we're going to get zero. So in this case, you might say Q1 for balloon number one. You might say Q2 for balloon number two. Both of them are going to cool down. Where does that energy go? Well, I'll call that Q3. That goes into the ice. It's 
itself. And there's a lot of ice and a lot of water. So uh, we, we know the final, what the final temperature is, is going to be. And that's kind of this clue here. Uh, and so when we come over to here, we are then cooling it down, as we said here, with a constant pressure. So this is going to be an NCP delta T for the first one, which I will guess I will call helium. And then we will have an NCP delta T for the nitrogen. And then we will have an M LF for the energy. And so essentially put, these are going to cool down. Their change in temperature is going to be a negative. So losing energy, losing energy. Both of these are negative numbers. They will lose energy. And that will tell us then what M <coughs> needs to be. How much ice needs to melt to absorb that much energy that is released here. So one of the things you're going to have to calculate here is the N, and that comes back here in, in this part of the problem here. And so N would be pressure times volume over R times the temperature. And again, all of your numbers are going to be a little different, so I can't actually calculate it here. But whatever the pressure and volume and R is the depending what units you're using, but I like the 8.31 to do it in um, units of, of joules. Um, and then the uh, temperature, um, but you can find out what your N is. Uh, the only other thing that might be a little challenging here is this, is this is the CP, which is 1R greater than the CV. And the CV has to do with the number of degrees of, of freedom. So if we come over here and we look at helium, we know that the helium, I'll start with CV, has three degrees of freedom. So you were supposed to catch that that would be three halves R for the uh, specific heat or the molar specific heat at constant volume. So it should be five halves R for the specific heat at constant pressure. And then likewise for the nitrogen, um, at constant volume it would have five degrees of freedom, uh, three translation, two of rotation, therefore Cp must be one R greater than that, and that would be a seven half. So we know that that's seven half R, we know that is five halves R, we know the number of molecules, we know the change in temperature, we know the latent heat, we can find M. And so how much mass melted? And uh, <coughs> somewhere in the neighborhood, two, three, four, five grams, depending on the numbers you have on, on your test. Number three, uh, it's a bit of a long problem. I was glad to see you guys nailed it pretty good. I was concerned about uh, time-wise, uh, which is actually why, I don't know if you caught this, but this was an exactly a, the, the uh, example I did in class here. It was, you know, from whatever chapter this was. I'm going to say 20, chapter 21. But we, we did this one in, in, in class. The only thing I added to it, uh, I changed the numbers definitely, and then they were different on the different tests. But I also added the last part, what is the overall efficiency of this, of this cycle. Uh, but as you look at this Carnot cycle, maybe I'll just do a, a PV diagram. But one of the cycles we discussed in great detail was one that would go an isothermal from A to B. Uh, then an adiabatic expansion from B to C, then an isothermal compression to D, and then finally an adiabatic compression uh, back to A. And so some of you drew the free body diagram, and uh, I, maybe I even should have asked that as a question, but I, I would encourage it. Always draw the free, the, uh, free body diagram, <laughs> the, the PV diagram, because it's like the free body diagram to me, in the sense that it really clarifies your thoughts and makes things uh, uh, hopefully a little bit easier to, to work with here. But if we then put these positions A, B, C, and D, and we list what is the pressure, what is the volume, what is the temperature at each of these locations, then I gave you 
that one, that one, that one, that one, and that one, which is different for each of the tests here. But those were all given information as you, as you, as you read it here. And so keep in mind, especially back here at A, this is the three, meaning that of these four unknowns, if I know the three, I can find the, the fourth. And the number of molecules will be very helpful to know because, ah, looking for your test over there on the far edge. Because once I know that, if I can know any of the other two across here, then with the number of molecules, I can get the last unknown here. So that's the first thing I noticed when I, I labeled this out. And so I would say, make sure you calculate N. It turns out you don't need to do it right away. Um, many of you did, and I did too, when I was making the solution set. I said, oh, okay, I'm just going to you know, figure out what N is right away. That, those three right there are kind of a dead clue that, you know, I probably need N. Um, and who knows, maybe I wouldn't need N, but, but you do need N before it's all, all said and done here. Uh, maybe not. There's different ways of doing it, so maybe not. No, your, your choice. But anyway, that's kind of the first thing I personally notice is that tells me N. But more than that is then, as I was trying to mention in class here, is the, try to look for the adiabatic connections. Uh, what's nice about things that are adiabatic, or for that matter, any of the isothermal or isovolumetric or isobarometric, whatever it is, you know, the certain things are, are more closely related than others. And so the first one I would connect to is this one. Um, whatever this temperature is, I'll call it temperature at A, is going to be also the temperature at B. And again, I can't put any numbers there because you guys are all different. But, but it is clearly the Carnot cycle. And the Carnot cycle, A to B, and even it says there, is an isothermal uh, process. So to me, that would jump out first. That, okay, hey, you gave me that, and then this is that, that connection uh, <coughs> there. Uh, the other one that is a nice connection, yeah? Oh, yeah, I bet you could. Yeah, yeah. They never actually solve for the number. Yeah. Yeah. And you may not even have to use it as a... Uh, no, I, be I bet you still got to use it as a symbol. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, so, if you did solve for it, great. If you didn't, that's, you know, fine too. Um, but one of the things that stands out in my mind is right away is this connection between A and D. A and D is the adiabatic uh, connection. And so PV is related to PV. And so our adiabatic connection was this, that the pressure at A times the volume at A raised to a power of gamma would be equal to the pressure at D times the volume at D raised to a power of, of gamma. And so that right there is what we have. We have pressure and volume at A. We also have volume at D. And so the open piece of the puzzle solves right there. And so that's kind of the next step that um, I noticed. I don't know if that's the only step you can do next. I, I, I still don't see any other steps you could do next. And so that's the one I, I would jump on right away. And of course, now that fits into my point of now I can get the temperature at D because the temperature at D would be the pressure at D times the volume at D divided by N divided by R. And so that's why I say you got those two. You can find that once you've done N or if you put N as a, a symbol in there. And of course, that's great because once you have that, that just goes right up to there because C and D are isotherms. And so once you have that, you've got the temperature now at D. And then again, same logic, that now I have these two together with the N, I should be able to get my pressure at C. And so this pressure at C is NRT at C uh, divided by the volume at uh, C. And then, looking at B again closely, but B and C right here are another adiabatic. 
And again, what's nice about the adiabatic ones is that if you know any two, they got to be connected to the other two. Now, in this case, I wouldn't try to do the P and the V because I would have the two unknowns, P and V. But I could do this setup. And so changing this a little bit, maybe starting with pressure at B times volume at B to a gamma would equal to pressure at C times volume at C to a gamma. And maybe getting rid of pressure by writing this as N R T at B over volume at B. I can get what I'm after, which that is N and R cancel off, and I got temperature at B times volume at B gamma minus one, and temperature at C volume at C gamma minus one. And so there's the mathematical relationship between temperature and volume between those two points that are adiabatic at uh, B and C. And so that should give me right there, that should give me the volume at B, that number, because I know the temperature at B and I know the temperature and volume at, at C. And so that's, that would fill in that piece. And of course, once I fill in that piece, I should be able to get the pressure at B uh, a number of different ways at this point. I could just do the ideal gas law, or I could even do the adiabatic process between pressure and volume there and, and, and get it. So there's the missing pieces of the, of the puzzle. The last one down here, the efficiency. Uh, remember, the Carnot cycle was the most efficient one and it was the temperature of the cold one, which, well, we wrote it in class as cold over hot. In our case, the cold one is point C, and the hot one is point A or B. And so once we've got these numbers, then we can just plug it into there and then get the efficiency and so that was good. Oh by the way, it, yeah it was not intended, some of you some of you made a whole nother chart to calculate the energies going in and going out and the efficiency and certainly you could do it that way but, but that's a long way of calculating the efficiency of a Carnot cycle. This is what I was after, just what is the efficiency of a Carnot cycle? What is the most efficient we can have an engine and still obey the first and second law of thermodynamics here. And so do you, you don't need to go off and do an energy chart. That's what the next problem is about. The next problem is the energy chart here. So number four, as you can probably have predicted before the test was that, okay, we, you, you want to calculate the energies between the uh, different cycles um, or different processes. This isn't actually a cycle. And uh, this is actually, again, one I, um, I'm trying to remember if I actually did this one in class. I think we ran out of time. I don't know if I actually did this one or not. It was certainly was on my, on my list. But anyways, this is a good one because if we look at a PV diagram, um, it lists the four different processes separately. It says, all right, imagine a gas starting at some kind of pressure, some kind of initial volume, and some kind of initial temperature. And, and you guys are all different, so I can't actually put a number here on the board. But in a PV diagram here, if we started here, A says, well, what if you heated it with constant pressure? Well, in a PV diagram, it would be this. Right? It would be a level line. That's constant pressure. Whereas, and so maybe I'll put a little A down here. This is process A. Process B says, what if you heat it at constant volume? Okay, well, constant volume is that. So there's B. And actually, I'll put the B on this side here. So the B doesn't get in the way because at C, it says you are going to compress 
Okay, so compress means smaller volume. So on this axis, we'd be going that way. And we compress it at a constant temperature. And so this is this hyperbola. And I'm not sure how far it would go. Um, we're just going to compress it. Um, the other option, D, is now we compress it adiabatically. Um, and so that has that same kind of curve we talked about. doesn't really have a name like a hyperbola or parabola. Too bad, we should give it a name here. Let's call it the City College uh, curve. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, but whatever mathematical you, you want there, that was that, that one that had, had, had more of a steepness to it. That was these guys here, a little more steep than the, the, the isotherms. Okay. But anyways, that's the four different uh, processes. And so there you want to calculate the energies. And my hint for you, and, and again, maybe that doesn't work well for you, but it, it certainly is my hint, and I say it again here, I think the best one to do is the delta E's first. The delta E, which has to do only with change in temperature, is always equal to NCV delta T. And that was that discussion we had that even if the process is not constant of volume, you will still have the delta E equal to that. And so that's the nice thing about the, the state function. So keep that in mind uh, as we, well, I guess the test's already taken, so, but keep it in mind for when you transfer, oh, the final, I forget that, for the final exam. And also when you take your thermodynamics, because it's a, it's a nice little process. So all of these, even though only one of them is isovolumetric, we can apply this equation to all these cases. So A, B, C, or D, if you know that change in temperature, N, C, V, you're, you got it. Now in this case, uh, what kind of gas is this? Uh, monoatomic, so we do have to say that this is our three halves R, but we do have the change in temperature right away in A and B, and indirectly we have it right away in C, right? Uh, the C is the isotherm, so I'll, well, so all of you should have a zero there. I mean, your numbers will be different here because your change in temperature will be different and the number of molecules will be different, but, but boom, 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 right, right away is kind of the first thing I see. And for me personally, then I would jump over to the Q because the Q is fairly easy to calculate if we have either a constant volume, volume or a constant pressure. So in this case, it's a constant pressure, so this is NCP delta T, and this is also NCV delta T, which is already that number, so there's no more math I have to do. That is the same number. In fact, that's why the work is zero, right? The, the work is zero, because that plus that has to equal that, and so this row fills in pretty good. In fact, now that you've done this number and that number, you can get this number right away too. Anytime you know any of these two, you, got, you know the third because that plus that has to equal that. Which is going to help us here for C because in, in C, uh, what we know here is that it's an isotherm, so this number is, is zero. And probably the one to calculate here is, is this guy um, because work being the integral of P D V means we can write this as N R T D V and because we have a constant temperature we get L N of final volume over initial volume. Well, here's where it gets maybe a little bit harder than at least these other ones. These were pretty easy. This one is in terms of volume, but you are given in terms of pressure. But again, keep in mind that initial pressure times initial volume, initial number of molecules, initial temperature equals final pressure, final volume, final number of molecules, and final temperature. And so in this C process, the uh, number of molecules doesn't change and the temperature doesn't change. And so, 
final volume over initial volume is actually the same ratio as your pressures. Now in reverse order, but that means we can put then an N, an R, a T, L, N of initial pressure over final. And that's how I did. It's not the only way to do it. So whatever choice you want to make here. But I like that process that, hey, this is the equation for the work done at constant temperature. That's why I can pull the T in front of the integral. Unfortunately, I get it in terms of volume, but I can replace the ratio of volumes with the ratio of pressures. And that is what is given. So given, 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 I can put in my, my numbers. And once I know that, I also know that because that has to be equal and opposite so that they add up to, to zero. And then finally the fourth one, probably the hardest one, although hopefully you solved that term right away. That right there is the zero, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> that's what we mean by the adiabatic process, that the Q is, is zero. And now we got to just decide how we want to calculate uh, the rest of these. Um, Again, I personally just jump on this one because this one is related to the uh, temperature change there. So, you know, I would look at this as, okay, initial pressure times initial volume raised to a power of gamma would be final pressure times the final volume raised to a power of, of gamma. But like we did over here, we can switch that into temperatures and Probably temperatures and pressure should be better. Yeah. So this was temperature and volume. Let's do temperatures and pressures. And so I will leave pressure alone, but in place of volume, um, let me put NRT initial over initial gamma. And then the same thing here. Pressure final, I'll leave alone. Um, and then I'll put an NRT final temperature over final raised to a power of gamma. And again, that way, the N and the R, each raised to a power of gamma, show up on both sides, so they go, go away here. Uh, but it looks like what I have here, uh, depending on how you want to write it, I'll put initial temperature in the numerator, so initial temperature to a power of gamma would be equal then to initial pressure, I'll leave the one minus the gamma and put it downstairs. You could change the uh, sign in the exponent and move it upstairs, which I think is probably a more common way to see this. But in either case, you are given the, the pressures and the initial temperature, then you can get the final temperature. And once you get the final temperature, you now have the change in temperature and you can get that one. And of course, once you have that one, then you also have that one. They're one in the, they're one in the same from the, from the first law of thermodynamics. Yeah. Um, yes, it would. Thank you. Got my son, that would be gamma minus one. Gamma minus one. Yes. Thank you. Hopefully that's what I did here. Yeah, good. All right. <laughs> and then finally, uh, number five. Another uh, put two objects in contact. Uh, this happens to be two cylinders. And so it's a little bit like the uh, thermal equilibrium one, although this goes a little bit farther and asks about entropy. But uh, number five says you have uh, one cylinder that somehow has a movable cylinder. Uh, you saw the ones I did in class a lot of times, so it had that little graphite cylinder that slides up and down. Uh, that's a nice one because when inside here what we can put is our polyatomic gas. And uh, is that the one that, yeah, with a movable piston so the pressure always remains the same. So the, so the pressure is of course atmospheric pressure plus the, the weight of the piston. And they tell us that, that pressure. The second cylinder is set in thermal contact with it. 
And the second one is constant volume. What kind? Oh, uh, let's, I'll just call it helium. It has some kind of monoatomic gas there. But uh, as we put these two together, this is going to be the hot one. And this is the cool one. And so there's going to be a flow of energy going from one to another. Uh, which also means there's going to be a flow of entropy going from one to another. So there will be a change of entropy and a change of entropy. And so this one is going to lose both entropy and heat. And this one is going to gain both heat and entropy. So the A part of this is what's the final temperature? Again, sum of the Q equals to zero. And so hopefully you have NCP delta T for the polyatomic gas and then an NCV delta T for the monoatomic gas. Okay, and so this is our say helium. Of course, we do take a moment here and we need to mention those again. Uh, we did earlier in that. That would happen to do with the number of degrees of freedom. And so this should be a 3 halves R. Uh, the polyatomic had that uh, 1, 2, 3 translational and 1, 2, 3 rotational. So 6 degrees of, of freedom. And so the CV would be 6 over 2 R or just 3 R. But then the CP must be 1 R greater than that, so it must be a 4 R. So putting in our 4 R, putting in our 3 halves R, putting in the number of moles that you have, you should be able to then get the final temperature. And so that's the first question there, A. What is that equilibrium temperature? And then the second half of this is then the entropy as the objects lose their energy. And so we learned that the change of entropy was, of course, the summation of the entropy. And the entropy change was a little bit of energy exchanged at that particular temperature. Uh, so we need to look closely at this integral. Uh, don't forget it is an integral. Um, I did see a lot of this on the test. And so I'll caution here. When does this come out to be true? Yeah, if the temperature is a, is a constant. And so we, we, we did some examples like that where the temperature was a, a constant. But that's not the case here. Uh, here the temperature does go down for this one and does go up from this one. So this is not going to work for this particular problem. What will work for this particular problem is an, an either a CV or a CP would be the change in energy depending on which one we're talking about. So if we're talking about this polyatomic where it's cooling down at constant pressure, I would use CP. Uh, but if we are talking about the monoatomic, which is warming up, we would use the CV. But in either case, what you have is NC, and I'll just again put a V or a P, and then you just have the integral of DT over T, which is the natural log of the final temperature over the initial temperature. Which, as we just did in A, we do have final temperature and we were given initial temperature. And so we need to put this in here. And so you will get a delta S that is less than zero for the polyatomic because you should get a final temperature that is lower than the initial temperature. And then that makes sense. It, it came out. And so both the Q was negative and the entropy was negative. The molecules slowed down. They're more organized. Uh, on the other hand, the monoatomic gas warmed up. And so the Q is positive. Energy went in and entropy went in. And so we would have a positive number there. And coming out as the second law of thermodynamics should, is that the whole process should have a net positive. So hopefully your positive number 
is bigger than the absolute value of your negative number, meaning that the whole process itself was a gain in, in entropy and a gain in, in randomness. All right. Well, good. You're smiling. At least some of you are. <laughs> All right. So, <coughs> keeping, like I said, keeping that in mind, and then we will put that aside <laughs> and <coughs> get started with our, our next unit. Mm. All right. So, let's, as we talked about before the spring break, get started with optics. So, I'll say it again, as you undoubtedly recall from the beginning of this class, this particular semester is different than our other semesters in the sense that we do four different little pieces. It can almost be like four mini classes. And so, we did mechanical waves at first where we had our sound waves, which by the way I will mention again and, and uh, because we are going to deal with light waves here, so we'll go back to our wave stuff. So hopefully you haven't forgotten all that good wave stuff we learned back in chapters 16 and 17 and 18. Um, of course, and then we spent four chapters on thermodynamics and uh, now we're going to spend another four chapters on optics and then, well, our, then our last section will be modern, modern physics here. All right. So, uh, I'll get started. There's some things I want to show you. I'll, I'll, I'll start with our, our bragging rights, if you haven't already heard. There's our, our new web page. Have you seen it? And there's a big sign out front, and I, I, I have this suspicion that that sign's going to be there forever, you know. <laughs> I'll be standing up here 20 years from now, and there'll be a big plaque on our uh, front of our school that says, number one in the United States. In... 2013. <laughs> uh, but it is something that you and everybody here at the school should be very, very, very proud of. And to be ranked number one in the United States I is. Who what? <laughs> oh yes. Shall we have a speech? <laughs> uh, yeah, Edith got to travel for us to D.C. and to uh, interview and. Uh, uh, what else did you do? <laughs> they interviewed and and spoke for you guys as students. So that was. And you you yeah you got to introduce the uh, um, second lady. Got there late, so I didn't get to introduce her. Oh. <laughs> and you got to meet her. Yeah. Sweet. Sweet, sweet. All right, anyways, I didn't mean to get sidetracked on it. That wasn't exactly what my intent was. My intent was to uh, get us started here and uh, wanted just to jump to our physics page, which I, I think you uh, remember. Uh, but I've got a nice little animation. Oh, actually, before I even do that, I will start ah, with this one. But I think a good place to begin here is where your author begins, and he kind of begins with a a a, uh, <laughs> a, a really a, a, a tough subject, really. Um, and and a, a few years ago, when I when he rewrote the the book and he put this issue here at the beginning, I was like, oh, that's going to be hard to to teach, and it uh, and. And it kind of is here, but, I, but, but his approach is, is, is pretty good. So I've grown over the years to ap appreciate this approach. And so that's where I want to I start here. So I want to start with this little diagram, and I want you to look at it carefully. What does it say? Light is, a wave is light a wave? Or is light a particle? <laughs> and so if you look carefully at it, the big picture is wave, right? And if you zoom in on it, it'll hopefully look a little more obvious that it says it's a, a particle, right? <laughs> well, yeah, and the graphics aren't that, you know, uh, high resolution here, so maybe, but, so it does get uh, a little choppy there. But, 
The point here is, this is our very first section. And like I said, it's not an easy place to begin. And your author then starts off, and as I was saying, at first it bothered me, but I've grown over the years to go, you know, I, I kind of like it. Um, it kind of just sets the stage. Unfortunately, it's, it's not really justified at the beginning. And so I, I, I think that's the part that I don't like, that justifying it as both a wave and a particle is going to take some time. And I'm not going to be able to do that for you today. And nor is the author even going to try to do that today. The author is just going to say this, that as we get into chapter or, excuse me, section five of the book, which is entitled Light and Optics. And the first part, chapter 35, the beginning part, as I'm sure you read over spring break. <laughs> I didn't get a chance to see your face. All right. Okay. <laughs> but it's entitled The Nature of Light. And then <clears throat> the second half is the law of geometric optics. And it is this phrase right here, the nature of light, that is, is, is really complicated. It's really not that, that simple. And, 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 and here's what he's, he's saying. Are you getting warm too? Or? No? I just, just. I got this. I got this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah, we all got issues. but <laughs> Some more than others, huh? <laughs> I'll just do a little bit. So it doesn't get cold on the edges and a little cross breeze there. Um, but this whole idea of the nature of light is your author is trying to set up and saying that should we treat our light as waves or particles? And I guess I shouldn't say should we treat them. I mean, how did nature make them? Are these waves? Are, there, are they particles? In other words, when you take a little beam of light, and so in my case, I'll kind of get started here with these red beams of, of light. Maybe I'll turn off the lights just a little bit, and we'll do more in just a moment here. But as these laser beams go across here, would this best be represented as a picture of little particles moving across? Like... <laughs> a bunch of little tiny baseballs traveling through the air or would it be represented as a wave traveling across <laughs> and this is a long long debate and basically the answer as this graphics is trying to illustrate is it's both. The real problem I think is us humans trying to understand the world around us. We like to categorize things and we like to say okay it's either a particle or a wave. And nature has its own rules and says no things are not just either a particle or a wave. You, you need a new way of describing the word. So we like to call them wavicles. So we will say light is a, a wavicle. And, and simply what we mean by that is sometimes it makes more sense to look at the wave nature of the light and describe light as a wave. But the truth is it's not purely a wave. It's a wavicle. Meaning there are times where calling it a wave makes a lot of sense. But not all the time. And other times it makes sense to call it a, a particle. But not all the time. And so the real answer here, I think, is our human lack of understanding. We want to put it in one category or another. And it's really not. I got a silly example for you that, that, that may work. I, I mean, you guys see me all the time standing up here talking about physics. I bet it would be really weird for you if you went by the park and you saw me coaching my kids' soccer game. You know? 
And it'd probably be embarrassing for me to see you, me yell at the ref and I'm, you know, cussing them out. No, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> right? Or some one of the little kids come up and kicks me in the shin. You know, or worse still, as my son always says, is teachers should never be in shorts. That's just <laughs> wrong, Dad. Right? It, it, it might be kind of weird, right? And you would look at it like, guys, he a teacher or a father? <laughs> well, my answer would be, I'm both. Right? You mostly see me as a teacher. And, and I the same for you. I mostly see you as a student, but it's always kind of weird. I end up going to you know, Trader Joe's and one of my students is boxing. I'm like, oh, hey, you, you have a job. <laughs> You're an employee. And, and you know to put the bread on top of the cans. Hey, good job. All right, thanks. All right. I'm, I'll see you in class, right? And so it's, a, it's, it's, it's just a very different experiment going on and a different experience because in that experiment I am looking at that individual or you are looking at that individual at a different moment and, and it, it's displaying something different. So it would be like me asking you, uh, are you a student or are you an employee? Well, I have a good sense that you're, you're both, right? And it depends on your observations. And that's what I'm trying to say here, is it depends on our observations. So, like I said, this graphic is really nice here. It, it, it is one that says, okay, look at this object in a little different light. Do we want to look at it like this? And this is kind of the pictures we'll draw. Sometimes we will say, and this is not a very good graphics, but sometimes we will say, here is this laser beam. This laser beam can be thought of as little tiny particles choo, 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 going in a straight line. And if there are little tiny particles, we give them a name. Question. So wait, wouldn't it make sense for a light to be a wave and a particle? Because a wave, the definition of a wave is uh, the ability to transfer energy without actually moving its medium. But the light is obviously traveling to space without, um, without, all, without, without an obvious medium in outer space. Therefore, light should be a particle because of that. And I don't see how you got particle out of that. I, I see how you said there was no medium. No, no, no. I guess I would answer this way. <clears throat> that would be a good argument to answer in that case that I would think of it as a particle. But there are just as many examples that I will give you over the next four chapters to make sense to think of light as a wave. And so there's not one particular case that I could say it always acts like a particle. And then there's not one particular case that I could say it always acts like a wave. However, I could describe it in both, both scenarios all the time. And so as you'll see here, there'll be times where I'll probably describe it as a wave or I'll describe it as a particle. And some of you will probably raise your hands and say, well, but what if you thought of it as a particle, how would it work? Or that, oh, okay, we can think of it that way too. So there's no one experiment that says I could not view it one way or the other. It is actually both They're at the same time. Uh, this is what I was saying. It is difficult for me to really get too much into saying it is a particle. Um, as we get more towards the end of this experiment, we're going to see a very famous experiment. Uh, we'll call it the photoelectric effect. Where what ha essentially happens is it has, and the Compton effect for two, for that matter, is we will put little electrons over here. And the light will come in and hit those electrons and ricochet off those electrons. And just like two electrons hit each other, they will spread out and they will have conservation of momentum and conservation of energy. We will see exactly the same thing happen for light. And you can't describe that in terms of a wave because the wave wouldn't have the, the uh, well, it wouldn't fit all the descriptions that were not there yet for me to completely argue my point of why we have to think of it as a particle and why we have to think of it as a wave. So that's why I said this is the part I don't like the author starting on such a deep topic because I can't argue well enough yet, but after four chapters we will, we'll see many times where we have to say this can only be explaining the light if we treat it as a particle. And, that, and that's coming, but I haven't done it yet. Yeah. So we have experiments to 
to show that light can't be a wave, and we also have experiments to show well, it can't be a particle. Can't always then be. Why a wave. don't we say light is neither a wave or a particle instead of saying it's a particle and a wave? Why don't we say it's neither? Well, and then what are you going to call it? How's that? It's something wave different. Wavicle. <laughs> well, a wavicle has both the properties of waves and and uh, and and particles. But the thing is, but it doesn't have all the properties. It has some of the properties. Uh, well, it has all the properties of both, depending on what experiment you do. So what we need is a superset, not a new set of definitions. We need a superset that includes both particles and waves. Does that make sense? I mean, and, and so if you want to give it its own name, that's fine. But, uh, but, uh, but I do want to emphasize, any of the properties we find for light fit in the category that we would have called properties for particles in mechanics and particles of waves that we would have done back in chapters 15 and 16. So there's no new uh, properties. And so we don't want to call a new category. What we want is a superset category of the two so what if you Unified. said one of the properties of a wave is once it reaches the end of its borders of its medium, it can go no further. Light doesn't have that property. Well, but what are you going to do with sound waves when a sound wave goes from air into, say, water? What about space? The sound wave goes to the edge of the atmosphere and reaches space and it can't go any further. Yeah. That is a property of a wave. No, well, you said it's medium, though, and so my argument was, but a, but a sound wave could go from air into water. Right. Oh, and you said it can't go any further. Right. Uh, I, okay, all right. I, I suppose there's a lot of things we could do, and, 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 and uh, but, I, but I will say this, no matter, if you narrow the definition of a wave, um, okay, um, I guess the real answer I'm looking for is we certainly could probably do something like that. I'm not sure that that adds anything to it. And I guess what I am trying to say is what we're going to do is take all the properties we learned about waves, all the properties we learned about particles, and then kind of put them together. And uh, so sometimes we will look at light as a wave and sometimes we'll look at it as a particle. That's, I guess, the short end of it. Uh, and we probably could come up with new definitions. Yeah, I don't know what the consequences of all that would be, but yeah, we could. Uh, maybe it would help if you explained what the medium, the uh, medium the light travels through as a wave is. Ah, okay, fair enough. Fair enough here. Uh, but let me keep going here because I, I just at this point just wanted to get some terminology out here. And the, so this first one is when we start thinking of um, the wave as particles. These little tiny particles, we're going to use the word photons, okay? And so when you hear that word photons, that's what we're talking about. Like I said, this graphic isn't really good. This is kind of showing that there are billions and billions and billions and billions of little photons. And the photons then are what are traveling across here. And they're the things that are going to come across and say, hit my hand and give their energy to my hand and my hand will warm up. So I know when I put my hand outside in the sunlight, it tends to get a little bit warm. I put it in front of a laser beam, it gets a little warm. The energy comes from these photons. But on the other hand, sometimes we will look at it as light. And this is really back to your question. If it is light, if it is a wave, then what is the medium and what is waving? And again, this is a little bit electro... Um, magnetic wave. And this is why some of you are probably wondering why we skipped a bunch of chapters before we, we came here. Is if you will notice that we just jumped from chapter 22 all the way up to 35. What was in between there? Yeah, electricity and magnetism. And half of you have already taken that. Uh, the other half of you have not. And so to catch you up to speed, for those of you who haven't, let me give you this picture, which is really your question here, is if you are going to view light as a wave, you have to ask what is waving. In other words, when we went back to sound waves, what was waving? 
Yeah, we would say it's the molecules, right? And if it's in air, we would say, okay, it's the molecules in the air. If this was sound waves in water, we would say it's the molecules in the water. If these were sound waves in, in an aluminum plate, we would say it's the aluminum molecules. But it's the actual vibration of the molecules. That was our sound waves. So what are light waves? What is vibrating there? When we draw something that looks like this, that goes up, down, up, down, up, down, that changes with time, what is changing with time? Hmm. Yeah, and so for those of you who haven't gone through Physics 122, this is supposed to be the picture of a wave. This, along what they would call the vertical axis, is a drawing of an electric field. And so the field itself is what changes. And at the same time, there is also a magnetic field. So hence the name electromagnetic wave. Because what is waving is the electric field, but what also is waving is the magnetic field. You have both of them. And again, see if this picture helps. Um, it's three-dimensional, so there would be a magnetic field, and in this picture I'd call that the horizontal direction. And so the direction of the travel of the wave would be in, what this would be kind of out of the board here, or out of the screen. And so in a three-dimensional picture, if I kind of mimic that, here's the beam going that way. So I will just turn on my simple laser beam here. Maybe I'll move this out of the way. But right now, I have a red laser beam. It's going across the room and eventually hitting the screen and eventually reflecting off and going to you. But as it goes across here, in a vertical direction, the electric field is changing. And in a horizontal direction, the magnetic field is, is changing. Now, of course, there's a lot behind electric fields and magnetic fields. Half of you have already done chap uh, Physics 122, and the other half are you're about to do it. So, but I think that's enough to kind of get everybody a mental picture of what we mean by these electromagnetic waves. Yeah. Well, I th okay, I think what you're doing there is you are integrating the two pictures together, right? And so I would say, how do you want me to describe light right now? Do you want me to describe it as a wave? So if I want to describe it as a wave, I will never use little circles and little dots, and I will never use the word photons, okay? So what I would say is, what is waving is an electric field, okay? There's no photons in that picture. Well, I'm not saying you can't, but we usually don't. I mean, could, but that that would, but that's not a no. It's not that quite that same analogy as sound. Yeah, it doesn't yeah it doesn't make a good analogy. What's changing as time goes on? So what changes is the electric field. And of course, I, you're probably asking, if you haven't gone through Physics 122, what is the electric field? But you did 122. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so what is the electric field? So what is the electric field? Yeah, yeah, I was afraid somebody would ask that. Um, this what actually makes the fact that we skipped all those chapters kind of hard to explain. But maybe I can do uh, an analogy by saying, well, what is a gravitational field? All right, so what if I come over here and I say, here's the Earth, going back to Physics 121, if I were to put something above the Earth like a rock, you would know that there would be a force pulling on that rock. And we learned from Newton that it would be G times the mass of the Earth times the mass of the rock divided by the distance between them squared, okay? But what I would say about a field then is that before you even put the rock there, so let me draw a new picture where I get rid of my rock 
So here's the earth. I will eventually put a rock there. But let's say there's not a rock there right now. When I do put the rock there, there will be a force. So without the rock there, there is no force, right? Is there anything there? And so this is what we like to say there is a field. There is a gravitational field. Uh, we like to symbolize it with arrows pointing inward. Meaning that what happens is the earth creates around it a field. Gravitational field, not electric field. Then it's the field that puts the force on the, the rock. So if that helped, since that was mechanic stuff, we could do the same thing with an atom. We could say there is a little proton, okay? And if you put a negative charge, an electron, near it, there would be a force of attraction between these two. But if I don't put the electron there, then there wouldn't be a force. Would there be anything there before I put the electron? And the answer is yes. I put a field. Whoops. And we like to direct the field away from positive one, so I'll change the direction of the arrowhead. Okay. But the good news here is um, you don't have to know too much about electric fields or magnetic fields, which is why this class is set up the way it is, that some of you have taken Physics 122 and others of you haven't. It, it won't be a handicap. Okay? But this is the, the field. So if I were to jiggle this, then the field would change and it would make ripples in the same way that if this was a bucket of water and I shook it, I would now make ripples and one ripple would make another, would make another, make another, make another, make another and the waves would travel across the bucket of water. Here too would happen with an electron. If I move the electron, it would make ripples of an electric field and that's what light is. So the field is created by all the Atoms of everything, everywhere? Anything that has charge makes a field. Okay. Right. And, that, and to ask more than that, I can't answer because that's where science is. I mean, that's the next step, right? Just like, why does the mass make a gravitational field? Why does charge make an electric field? So if you were to move the Earth out of the way instantly, would that rock... Feel it instantly, or it oh no! It would take time. The, yeah, the the field, uh, the field. Um, <sighs> oh, let me let me change it for you. Uh, you you hear this many times. What if, what if the uh, sun just instantly was gone? Would you be able to see that the sun is instantly gone? No, most people say, no, you don't. Why not? Because the light that left there was eight minutes ago. So if you could get rid of the sun instantaneously, then the earth over here would still be receiving light for eight minutes, right? And change, I think it's eight minutes and 20 seconds before you realize, oh, hey, the sun is now gone here. Same question about the orbit. As the Earth is going around in an orbit, right here, if the Sun was instantly gone, would the Earth go in a straight line instantly, or would it continue to follow the path of an orbit for eight more minutes? And the answer is eight more minutes. It would take, it does travel at the speed of light. And as you'll see, the speed of light is a terrible name because speed of light tends to be the speed of all of our fields, all of our electromagnetic waves, including light. And uh, we as humans discovered the speed of light first, and so we called that the speed of light, but it really should be a much broader name than the speed of light. Gravitational fields, all fields, magnetic fields, electric fields, gravitational fields, the, both nuclear fields, they all travel at this speed of light. So it should be more like the, the speed limit of the universe, you know, or some other better name than just the speed of light. And light is just the first one we as humans discovered. In a vacuum, so gravity slows down in a medium? 
<laughs> uh, no, no, that's a little different. The light slows down for a different reason than, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, but I don't know if I did this justice, and I probably spent too much time, and I told you this first step is really deep, and I was afraid of this, that you're going to ask a lot of really tough questions, because it is. It is something that most books don't even mention until the end of four uh, chapters on optics, that light is, th is considered both a wave and a, a particle. And so your author does it up front. So like I said, you'll hear me use that analogy many times through, for the rest of the semester. I will ask, are you a student or are you an employee? Okay, well chances are you're both. Actually, probably some of you don't have a job, but um, uh, forget that for a moment here, but assuming you do have a job, that uh, you are probably both. And it depends on the experiment I do. And on a daily-to-day -day basis, I mostly probe if you're a student. Because I look in this room or in the lab room, and I seldom look, uh, you know, on State Street or at Trader Joe's or whatever and say, oh, you, you are an employee. But I'm sure that, you know, the results of my experiment would be different if I set it up different. And I said, oh, hey, you are an employee. You're not a, you're not a student or you are a, a parent or you are a sibling or you are a spouse or maybe you're all of those. And so that's my whole point. You can be all of those at the same time. It's just what you're doing at that moment gets more <laughs> amplified at that particular point. And right now you're being more of a student than you are as a, a parent or an, an employee. All right. Now, let's keep going with this because both of these models work really well. And like I said, depending on our experiment, we will look at, at different things. Well, maybe I'll, I'll leave that here. The first thing to ask is whether we're looking at them as particles or whether we're looking at them as waves, they must have a speed, right? And so... I'll just put them collectively in my little picture here and say, okay, what's their speed? <laughs> All right. I heard some of you say, hey, the speed of light. Well, exactly. It is the speed of light. The standard symbol we like to use is C. Um, I don't think you'll confuse that with our thermal dynamics and the specific heats of C or, you know, whole new topic here. But C is the symbol we like to use for the speed of light, although I should really say speed of light in a vacuum. Speed of light when there's nothing around to interfere with it. Because as we will soon see, the light does change its speed. It does have an influence. And this kind of goes back to what you guys were asking earlier. This would be what would happen out in outer space. In outer space, you would make an electric field, which that electric field would then make a magnetic field. And that magnetic field would then make an electric field. And that electric field would make a magnetic field. And so you don't need any medium. So unlike sound waves, these waves are different. It's why we did not put this in the category of mechanical waves. These waves do not actually need molecules to go from one step to another. They build on themselves. It's kind of like the Disney cartoon where you see Mickey Mouse, you know, driving the train. And it's Goofy at the end of the train who picks up the rails and then runs to the front of the train and then puts them down. Right? And so you just make your own path. And that's the way light works. Where the electric field makes a magnetic field, makes an electric field, makes a magnetic field, makes an electric field, and it just goes. It does not need any molecules to continue on. And so this would be the speed. And then, as we go through water or air, things are going to get in our way, and we're going to go a little bit slower. Yeah. So light slows down in something other than a vacuum. Is that also true for electromagnetic waves or electric fields or magnetic fields? Ah, okay. Well, now I, I might as well do it now here. The <clears throat> I was going to wait just a second and talk about the speed of light, but I should maybe give you a bigger picture. Uh, I think you're asking it from Physics 122 here. Mm -hmm. Let me give you a much bigger picture here. We are going to be studying what we call optics. We call them optics even though they're electromagnetic waves. But they're called optics because they're what human eyes can see and detect. 
Remember when we did sound waves? Remember we had a sonic range? Didn't we have an infrasonic and an ultrasonic? What do we mean by those? <coughs> what we meant by sonic is there is a range where the molecules, when they bump into each other, sound waves, where humans can hear. But is it possible to have waves at a higher frequency than what human ears are designed to detect? Certainly, and we call that ultrasonic. And there was also frequencies lower than what the human ear was designed, so we called that infrasonic. Okay, and so what I'm trying to say here, and uh, I'll come back to the speed of light, but what we saw is your human ear picked up pitch, right? What was the difference in pitch? If you had a, a, a musical note that was a low pitch and a high pitch, what did we learn many weeks ago? <clears throat> that was a different frequency. But fundamental physics was still the same. Weren't they still molecules hitting each other? And so your ears could detect that frequency. And the same thing is true here for light waves. And I should probably call them electromagnetic waves. There's a whole big range of frequencies. And that's really your question. And that's what this chart is trying to show here. This chart is trying to show that we can have different frequencies. And I guess they plot frequencies across here. We can have very high frequencies in this range. We can have very low frequencies in this range. We could also have in between here. This is the part of the electromagnetic spectrum that our eyes to detect. And so just like our ears can't pick up every frequency, our eyes can't pick up every frequencies. Our eyes are designed to pick up a window from one value to another. We'll talk about that number in just a second. But I think this graphic answers your question is, are there frequencies higher than what the eye can detect? Yes. Are there frequencies lower than what the eye can detect? Yes, and we actually use them a lot and all of these are called electromagnetic waves. And so this very small band here is called the visible spectrum. And what's the difference between say red and green light? The frequency. And so again using that analogy back with sound waves, your ear can detect different frequencies and it gets registered in your brain as different pitches or different tones. Your eyes can do the same thing. Your eyes can detect different frequencies. And the way it communicates that to your brain is it calls it different colors. You know, that is a dark blue, that is a light blue, that is a red, that is a more of a maroon, that is more of a green, that is more of a yellow. And what that is, is light waves coming to my eyes at slightly different frequencies. And so a very narrow range is from red to blue. And then frequencies above and frequencies below. And you are maybe more familiar with these stuff that are below, like the infrared and with radio and Wi-Fi and cell phones and all these electromagnetic waves, microwaves, all these ones that we use in terms of our technology and our communication. They're exactly the same type. They are a wave where the electric field makes a magnetic field, which makes an electric field, which makes a magnetic field, and so forth and on down the, on the line. Does that help? Uh, and so the answer is yes, because they're exactly the same thing.
Yeah, there we go. We've got two. We've got the apple. Right. Okay. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, like like I said, maybe and maybe I spent too much time here. I actually I did. I'm quite sure of it here. But what I'm, what I'm trying to say here is then these are the different frequencies, and we can do some calculations. Let me do some calculations. And to do some calculations, I need to come back to here. I talked about the speed of light in a vacuum, but I haven't given you the number. Anybody know the number? Yeah, just three times ten to the eight meters per second. It's worth remembering here. We're going to see it again and again and again. Uh, I say that because we already see it right here. If I were to come over here and give you some information, we tend to list the different ends of the spectrum here in terms of wavelength. Violet light, as you can see, is the shorter of the wavelength, 400 nanometers. Red light tends to be over here at the longer wavelength, 700 nanometers. So in terms of frequency, what would be the endpoints? And maybe I'll even put green in the middle. 550 yeah, nanometers. Why are those numbers so clean? Oh, no, they're not as much clean as they are just rough approximations. Okay. Okay. And you'll see it in the lab. When you do the lab, uh, not this week, but I think next week when we actually look in our spectroscope, you'll see the whole range of colors. And, you know, people will, you know, measure and go, okay, I, I can see up to, uh, and, and 700 is a, for a little low. I mean, most of you, I'm sure, will see the, uh, the 710, the 720s. I'm a little too old to see those, so I usually see about the 700s. And many of you will see down into the 300s. Again, I have a hard time seeing down in the 300s and the 400s. But no, it's just like the 20 to 20,000 for the sound waves was just kind of a rough number. Every human eye is a little bit different. But what I do want to point out here is this, again, I hope I'm getting my point. Looking at this in terms of waves, we would say we have electromagnetic waves. Your eyes detect electromagnetic waves at least in this small range. And the reason you see different colors is those are different wavelengths or different frequencies. And if we go back to our chapter on waves, if we know wavelength and speed, couldn't we get frequency? So let me get out the calculator and say, okay, what is the frequency? Then maybe I'll start down here at the lower frequency, that is the longer wavelength. And so this would be 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second for the velocity. Its wavelength would be 700, what's nano? Negative 9, and it's in hertz. Hertz is an inverse second. So this, uh, whoop, sorry, <laughs> getting ahead of myself, meters. So that meters will cancel off, and what I will have is inverse seconds, which is hertz. And if I get a number here, I get 3 times 10 to the 8th divided by 700 nanu coming up to be 4.2, and I'll round it to a 9, times 10 to the 14. And so we're at about 429 terahertz. Oh, that's me. <laughs> 429 terahertz. Okay. And so that would be the frequency. It's a huge frequency is my point here. And so my second point, and I'll go back to my first one. The first one being, see how the different frequencies 
or different wavelengths get re registered in your eyes. Those are different colors. And then these are the numbers. These wavelengths are very, very small or their frequencies are very, very high. Okay? And we'll do the other side. The other side near the violet would be what I get if I put in 400 nanometers. So go back to my enter, change the 700 to 400, and this comes out to be 7.5 times 10 to the 14 hertz. So that's 750, 750 tera hertz. So huge frequencies, right? And a whole different set of range of these of these frequencies. That's the the idea here of these different colors. In fact, it's kind of nice to actually see these in what I would call real time, if you will. If I turn down the lights a little bit and just have the door open enough here, I think we can actually get some light in here. And I have a nice little what we'll call dispersion prism here. I think that's going to be dark enough. Let me grab a mirror. No, we're going to have to have this open. No, 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 you're fine. I just want to get a little sunlight in the classroom there. <laughs> All right, so if I put the mirror out into the sunlight, um, you can see it there on the door. If I pull my hand in it, you would say, what color is that? It's white. And why is it white? Because it has all the colors in it. So one of the first experiments here is with a little prism. Maybe we'll get a little bit closer and put it on the screen there. But if I were to adjust it right, hopefully you can see the, uh, the colors. And so there is the you know, the Roy B G. Biv, the, the red, the orange, the yellow, the green, the indigo, and then the, and then the blue. And so there's the colors, uh, like I said, separated. Intensity separated. Intensity when you separate it out, it seemed brighter when it was all together. Oh, uh, I, yeah, I think as you said, it's the concentration, the intensity. When it, they're all together, I got all that same energy in a, in a tight spot. And then when I spread it out, that same energy gets spread out a little bit, a little bit further there. Okay. Well, there, as I said, is kind of the beginning part. This is where your author gets started in the beginning of the chapter. What is the nature of light? And that's what he does. And that's what I wanted to do is to say, look, this is the different uh, pictures we can have. We can either think of them as particles or we can think of them as as waves. And if we think about them as waves, then we would label them with a frequency and a wavelength. And that would tell them their, their, their color here. And that was, like I said, the, the point here of this beginning part. Now, if you look carefully at light, and your author does a good job of showing you a couple of pictures of this, he says, because the wavelength is so small, watch what happens if you were to send light through a small opening or a small hole. Um, don't quite see it on here. Ah, there it is. And uh, maybe I'll do all three, ooh, three pictures. I think there's a bigger one. There we go. And he says, all right, if you want to look at light, remember it's a really small wavelength. And that really small wavelength would do what? And I, this picture, and then hopefully this real laser beam shows it really well here, is what happens if something goes through what I would call a big hole. Now, this is how he labels it. What he means by big hole. The size of the hole, D, is much greater than the wavelength. And what will happen is you will block it on the edges. This is what many people would call an argument for, hey, light has to be a particle. 
because we see ocean waves. I mean, if you've ever seen ocean waves come into like the mouth of a harbor, they will come in and what happens after they go through the opening of the harbor? Yeah, they spread out. What we're going to call diffract. They look something like this, don't they? Well, my argument is going to be that, okay, if you want to think of light as a particle, that's true. But you can also think of light as a wave. Waves do spread out, but they only spread out when the opening that they go through is near the size of their wavelength. And what is the size of our wavelengths? They're really, really, really small. And so, if I put this laser beam through a big opening, so I'll just open it real big, and then, as you can see, I can close it to be real small. But if I were to put light through a big opening, like sunlight coming through a door, or this laser beam, what do you think would happen? Well, if I put the beam here, it blocks it, blocks it, blocks it, blocks it, blocks it, and then I get to the hole, it goes through. It looks a lot like this. If the beam hits here, it gets blocked. We could think of these as particles. These would be like little baseballs. These would be little photons. Stop, 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 stop. Go straight, go straight, go straight. Stop, stop, stop. And so in that sense, that would make a nice picture of little particles. They don't spread out at all. And I would say this is a good argument to say, oh, light must be made out of particles. Okay. But what happens if I send light through an opening that's really small? Well, there's the laser beam there, right? On the wall. Doesn't look like to me it spread out at all, right? And I would say, okay, yeah, it doesn't spread out because it's going through a big opening. What if I were to make that opening really small? Of course, now it's so small, it may be too dim for you to see. But can you see it it's spreading out now? Now, it's spreading out not as much as this picture kind of illustrates, because I'm not going to make a hole that is much smaller than the wavelength of the light. As you can see, the wavelength of light is really, really small there. But there is a spreading out of light. Without the hole, it goes straight. With the hole, if I can get it just right, there's a spreading to it. And so again, this would be my argument that, okay, now in this experiment, I've got to think of light as a, a wave. And so it depends what experiment I do, I will see either property. I will see properties like this, or I will see properties like, like this. And it's why your author says, probably the easiest place to get started, and this is where we're going to get started this chapter, is let's look at big objects. So let's never get in this category here. At least not this chapter. We'll wait for other chapters before we get down to this size. But for our beginning size, what if everything we have is just big openings? Big optics. And when I say big, I mean anything bigger than a micron. Because you got to remember, these are wavelengths in the nanometers. And so if we're a micron or bigger, compared to light, that's considered big. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, uh, you see the same thing if you ever looked at a street light through the screen on a, you know, on a window. You look out, you see a street light or the moon or as you said, you kind of you squint or look through a little hole. You'll see the light spreading out through a little, little hole. Well, as I said, your author says, okay, so let's begin this discussion by looking at light going through big objects. Or, in this case, not even going through an object, but reflecting off an object. So your author says, okay, let's shine some light. And I don't know if you can see this one really well. But he says, let's shoot a laser beam on a mirror. And he just lays a mirror flat on the ground. I'll do the same thing here. I will take a mirror. Where's my mirror? So I don't know if you can kind of see this shiny edge there. Okay, that's my mirror. It might be nice if it was bigger, but I'm just going to take a little piece of a mirror here. Okay, 
and I am going to turn off the lights here and I am going to shine the laser beam on the, the mirror and as I rotate the mirror you'll see that it reflects but maybe more importantly is where does it go after it reflects? And if we go back to our mechanics and think of these as little photons, um, yeah, I'm just gonna draw a picture, but bummer. Maybe I'll have to turn it back on and off. But if you have this little baseball coming in here, and again, I'll call it baseball, but I guess I really mean photons here, okay? And I draw a line perpendicular to it. Then what I would say is this baseball coming in has a velocity in the normal direction. And it has a velocity in a parallel direction. And so if you can imagine a little baseball coming in and bouncing off without losing any energy it would still have the same velocity parallel and the normal component will be the force, the ricochet, if you will. And so the baseball comes in, the baseball comes out. But what would you say about this angle, which I will call this the angle of incidence, compared to this angle, which I will call the angle of reflection? Oh, and actually, you know what? I want to use the same notation as your author. I think he does one and two. Let me just double check that. Where does he... Chapter 35. Does he call it one and two? And oh, he calls it one. <laughs> and... One prime. He's saving the two for another reason. Okay. All right. So more on that in just a second here. But what I wanted you to see in this picture, and maybe better on the board here, is if I draw a line perpendicular, and maybe I'll even block a couple of rays, so it won't look quite so crowded. Is that wrong? I wish I could draw better. Is that perpendicular? But for our first real start in optics is I'm hoping you can see that this angle, so this would be the light beam, and this would be the light beam. This angle here, angle one, and this angle here, which your author calls angle one prime, the reflected angle, says they are equal. So theta one equals to theta one prime. And that's what's gonna happen when things bounce off here. Just like a baseball would that didn't lose any energy. Now these aren't really baseballs, so, so the similarity only goes so far. But a baseball without losing any energy, the angle in would equal the angle out. Yeah. So if the light wave is moving like this towards the mirror, would it matter if you moved the mirror a slightly closer or further from the laser box to change that angle slightly? Um, well, there's two ways I can move this. If I just move the beam back like here... Would that just slightly change the angle because of the way the light is moving up and down? Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, be careful here when we say the angle, too. You're, you, okay. I, d I didn't use a wave model, okay? Would the wave matter? No, the wave wouldn't matter, and this is why, is if this is the mirror, okay, and this is what I will call the normal, and this is the direction of the traveling direction of the beam. The wave part, I think, is what you're saying is the angle of the electric field may be different. That's not what I'm focusing on. The, the angle that I'm focusing on is the angle 
between the direction of travel of the wave, not the angle of the electric so the field. Phase angle of the wave where it hits the mirror doesn't matter at all. Correct. Yeah, so the, that's a good way of putting it. The phase angle of where the wave hit does not matter. As it would make sense because you can imagine over time this whole wave is going to hit. There's going to be, what are we, you know, four hundred trillion waves every second that are going to hit there. And so they, they, you know, they keep changing within that short time frame. So it's not the, it's not, again, it's not the direction of the electric field that is in connection. It is the direction of the, uh, it is the angle of the direction of travel and the normal. Okay. No, I'm not saying the wave is longitudinal, but what I am saying, it's n what's not relevant is the direction of the electric field. What's relevant is the direction of travel. Does that make sense? And there's some other issues there too, um, but yeah, that, that I uh, don't want to get bogged down in there too. But Anyways, this is, I think, the easiest one to draw first and the easiest one to say. Now, here's why. Here's my warning for you. As you guys go into this weekend, you're going to have some homework problems. And some homework problems will be easier than others. Some will be pretty hard. Um, keep in mind, say, something like this one. Here's a good one to look at. Here comes the laser beam in at 65 degrees, hitting mirror number one. It's going to ricochet off. It is then going to hit mirror number two at 20 degrees. I mean, uh, mirror, sorry, mirror number two, which is angled at 120 degrees from mirror number one. Uh, as it comes in and hits mirror number two, it's going to ricochet off. What direction is the final ray? And I claim, do you want the answer? to all the problems that at least fit this category we're gonna look at other categories too but all the ones of it that's it that's the key to the problem what we call the law of reflection and so you're gonna have a lot of geometry this is this next couple of chapters you are gonna have the wonderful blessing of reviewing your geometry and it will be either easy for you or hard for you based on how much geometry have you remembered because we will do a lot of geometry. So let's start here with a little geometry here. Here's the physics. The physics is if this beam comes in and they say it's 65 degrees then what angle is this when it leaves? 65 degrees. That was the first part I was trying to illustrate here. This is called the law of reflection. The angle of the incident light equals the angle of the reflected light. Okay. So now, if you know that that angle is 65 degrees, don't you know this angle? What angle is that one? Yeah, if this is the normal, the whole thing has to be 90, right? So isn't that a 25? All right. Now, what does that 25 tell me then about gamma? Okay. Looking at this triangle, what do you know about the sum of the angles inside a triangle? Yeah, they're 180. In fact, maybe I should start putting this on the board. So my, my uh, lowercase delta, what did we say? 25? Is that what it came out to be? 25. So then my lowercase gamma is... Uh, is that 35? Let's <laughs> 180 minus uh, is 50, 50 cut in half. Oh, it's still 25. Yeah. 30. 120. 180 minus 20. Is, oh, that's 60. Okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. Yeah, you're right. I believed you. I'm sorry. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So let me just double check. So that's 50. That's 60. 60. And, yeah, okay. Yeah, I should have listened. All right. All right. All right. Okay, but anyway, so that's 35. But you get the idea, right? It's a little game of geometry. So now, wait a minute. If that is then 35, what's this one? Isn't that 50? 
Uh, I better. 55, right? So if that's 55, then this one has to be 55, right? And so there is the, the angle here. Now, if they want to know the deviation angle, this is where the ray would have gone, right? This is where the ray is now going, right? So what they really want to know is this beta, what I would call the deviation angle. What, ang what is the change in the angle from where it was going to where it is going, right? And so I've got more geometry to do. Now that I've figured out these angles here, could I get alpha? And of course, there's not just one way to do it. The first one that pops into my mind here is if I look at this four-sided object, and so I'm going to extend this out and get that angle. Because if I know that's 120, and these are normal, so they're 90 degrees, then this angle here has got to be 60, right? Alright, so I know that that one's 60. Now the reason I care about that one is then, is if I draw this four-sided object, and maybe I should ask, what's the sum of the angles of a four-sided object? 360, right? Okay. So then I can get this angle here. I can get that angle there. I know that angle. I can get alpha. Once I get alpha, I can get beta. And I'm pretty sure that it actually is one of your homework problems. Find a, the deviation angle. What angle was the light traveling? What angle is it traveling now? Yeah. Oh, now, okay, I haven't used the word images or virtual or real yet. In fact, in this whole chapter, we won't. We, that's next chapter. Yeah, this is, just, this is just understanding the motion of light. And so for those of you who are looking ahead mentally, you get the idea that this ability to reflect the light is going to give us the ability to form images, right? That's why we care about reflections. We care about reflections and understanding reflections because they allow us to control the light and we're going to create telescopes and microscopes and so one way of controlling the light is reflection and that's what this part is about. Okay, But that's not the only way. There's also refraction. Let me show you another picture here. I think your author does a good job with this picture and I can kind of set it up here on the board. We'll definitely have to turn the lights low to uh, see this. But he shines the laser beam on a glass block. I don't even see the glass block in this. I think it's this one, but it's... Don't see it real well. Bummer. Well, let's see if I can show it to you a little bit... Uh, better here. I'm going to take away this mirror and I'm going to replace it with just a glass block. And so it's just a glass surface here. There's no mirror. Except you might remember seeing this exact same experiment when we did sound waves. We sent sound waves and, uh, and maybe I shouldn't say sound waves, but what I should say is those torgelin waves. You remember that little machine that had the rod sticking out and I made a little wave? And what happened when it went from one medium into another medium? Let's see if it gets dark enough for you to see. Um, maybe I'll angle it quite a bit. But do you see this first part I was showing you, which I will label as theta 1 and theta 1 prime, that's a reflection. In other words, I don't have to have a mirror to get a reflection. All I have to have is a difference in the medium. Because didn't some of the light go into the glass block? Can you see it in here? And that's what's nice about this glass block is not only did some of the light then reflect, but some of it actually then refracted. I'll 
turn that off and maybe we can see it a little bit better here in the when it's dark and so this beam which I will mark something like this and I'll have to turn the lights back on so you can see it but I'm gonna draw around the glass block and then I'm gonna draw a line here and a line here and a line I should have drawn it better there but I really want you to see two things happening the first one is what we've been talking about when the light hits a surface there's going to be a reflection and the reflection is pretty easy to do mathematically the angle coming in equals the angle going out the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection but what else do you notice with the light well some of it goes into the block and this part that goes into the block is called the refraction of the light and notice the light did not keep going in the same direction if I were to draw the same direction the light would have done this right and it didn't do that so the other half of this chapter is where does the other light go I mean some of the light reflects but the other of it refracts and how do you get that angle and that's gonna be a little harder yeah oh okay fair enough um, there obviously is losing some light coming out that's why we see it but that's the, the way it's designed but it's just, so it's a small percentage so let's call these photons for a moment and say there's billions and billions and billions of photons. A few hundred million bounce off and come our direction, but the main ones keep going, which show the whole pattern. What do you call that? Is that also refraction? Scattering. Okay. Those are, yeah, scattering. Uh, what causes the refraction? Ah, I'm glad you asked here because that's what I want to get into here now is that, okay. That the first part of this chapter was the reflection. The second part is the refraction. And so, your author, I think, does a good job showing this picture. And I'll kind of do the same picture here in a second. Um, I've got a little different approach. And I don't think these are all the pictures, but maybe they are here. But your author says simply this. Forget light for a moment. Let's just go back to mechanics here. Okay? What would happen if you were rolling a barrel along a concrete floor and then it went into some grass? Wouldn't it go a little slower as it traveled into the grass? And as it goes a little bit slower, what's going to happen? This corner of the barrel hits the grass first. What happens to it? It slows down. Now it slows down while the other side is still on the concrete, not slowing down. What would happen there? And that's what a turning is. And so again, let's just not even think about optics for the next five minutes. Let's just think about mechanics. What do you need to make a car turn? To make a boat turn? To make an airplane turn? To make a rolling drum turn? What is a turn? A turn really is when one side is going slightly faster or slower than the other side. Uh, my little experiment is right here. I've got these set of wheels. And these wheels are bolted together. They have the same circumference. And if I were to place the wheels up here and give it a little roll, I would say those two wheels are traveling the same speed. And of course it goes in a straight line, right? And it doesn't matter whether it goes slow or fast. As long as these two wheels are going the same speed, then they will go in a straight line. But by adding a little more radius, 
or circumference to one of the wheels. I'll do that by just putting some rubber bands on here. I'm hoping you will see that this wheel now is a little bit bigger in radius and hence then a little bit longer in circumference. And so when I put this on here and give it a push, what happens? And so what a turn is, is a turn is when one side... Those of you who didn't, I'll, I'll get the new packet now.